All right, all right, all right. So if you happen to be passing by the Red Hat booth, uh, I would like us to uh, please welcome and join me. I'm going to do a OpenShift presentation. OpenShift is a container platform. I hope that this will not uh, bore you uh, or take more than 25 minutes. Um, thank you very much. All right. Very good. So uh, what I'll be doing this, I'll be using two different OpenShift versions. One is a version uh, upstream version that you can just go to uh, openshift.org slash VM and download the virtual machine and play on your, uh, on your environment. No need to uh, buy anything, just have fun. Another uh, version that I'll be using is called OpenShift Online. It's the, the development preview version of Open OpenShift Online. So the exact same version of OpenShift that you would likely install in your environment, we have it installed on Amazon, right? So that shows how much we trust the platform. So, uh, and we've been doing this model for a while. So we have a uh, online version of the product and that's the same version that our customers get to install on their own environments. So it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, we've, we've had on the OpenShift Online more than, uh, I think, uh, almost 3 million apps deployed. And I think it today gets around 4 billion requests a day. So that shows um, just how much, how powerful the, the platform is. And again, the same that runs on AWS can run on any uh, cloud provider and can run on your environment, right? So I'm going to do a quick, uh, quick demonstration of OpenShift here. No slides at all, right? Because we're all tired of seeing slides here. Uh, so everything on OpenShift starts with a project uh, and you have to see project as a, a kind of a sandbox of a resource constrained area for you to deploy things, right? And when I say things, because you may be deploying a database, you may be just de deploying a set of scripts, or you may be deploying a application platform like JBoss or Wildfly, or, or even we have people that deploy um, uh, WebSphere and WebLogic on OpenShift, you can deploy all sorts of things. Essentially, anything that runs on a Linux machine can run on OpenShift because all, all that runs on OpenShift, it's uh, Linux containers wrapped in a Docker image. So we can run any Docker image. You bring your own Docker image. If you have a Docker image already on Docker Hub that I could try, I will very glad, very happy to try your image here running on this environment, right? Very good, so I'm going to create a project my project is going to be named Thomas, right? Yeah, so if this is the Thomas project, and uh, this environment they're running runs on OpenShift Online, right? So it's a development preview running on AWS. And a good thing about this project is that it is already resource constrained. So I can deploy just a set a number of applications, or I can deploy, I can use just, I think, two cores uh, and two gigs of RAM. So imagine yourselves, you're going to give a project to your developer and you say, you are happy to do anything, break, do whatever you want, play, delete with this set of amount of resources and they can delete and can try again, right? So it gives developers freedom. They don't need to come to you and ask, oh, I'm going to need a VM. And then you say, open a ticket and then two months, right? That's, that's what happens, right? Uh, some people are actually happy to have in just two weeks uh, a VM. So I'm going to create here, as you guessed, I'm going to be creating a Wildfly Java application. Wildfly is our upstream version. It's the community version of the, our JBoss Enterprise application platform. We actually have some of the Wildfly engineers around our booth. So if you have more, let's say, deep questions about Wildfly, we'll be happy to answer those. And to show that this is a, let's say, I'm not afraid of doing real demos, everything here is going to be real. So I'm going to be deploying a Java application a very simple Java application just to show uh, the platform. So my Java application is going to come from this repo here, Git repo, I hope you can see. I'm, I'm in fact, I'm going to clone this repo and deploy it from my own. So I'm going to go to GitHub right now. Let's hope our conference uh, uh, internet uh, allows us. I'm going to fork this thing. Awesome, I'm going to fork this. Uh, you already have forked this repo. Okay, so let me go here. So this is the repo that I have forked. Uh, there it is. So instead of using that one, I'm going to use my own, okay? So let's, uh, let's come back to OpenShift and I'm going to be using my own, right? So this is my here, my repo. The name of my application is going to be Simple App, because it is. 
Now, the objective of OpenShift is to automate every single step, possible step between code and production, right? I know that some companies are regulated, so they have, let's say, regulated constraints and they, they cannot take automatically code production. Some people have to sign off, have to blast the image. There are, let's say, some compliance regulations, but ideally, with OpenShift, you could take from code to production with no manual interaction, okay? Uh, and there are multiple, way, multiple ways we do this. As you can see here, I'm referencing a source code repo. So that means that I'm going to get the source code from that repo. I'm going to compile that source code. It's a Java source code. Compile, generate a WAR file. As I said in the beginning, everything that runs on OpenShift runs on Docker. I'm going to create a Docker image with that, uh, that source code compiled push that Docker image to a registry, and this is really good because on the registry is where you're going to verify uh, your compliance checks. So you can have compliance checks on the registry. Who could push images through the registry? Or we have a development registry and a production registry. Who can access the production registry? So this is where normally we see people adding the compliance, thing and compliance aspects on the registry itself, right? Uh, and then we want to automate, right? So one thing we're going to do is I'm actually going to uncheck this box here and talk about it later, right? Uh, so we're going to build the image. And a very important thing, I want OpenShift to configure a build webhook trigger. That means that whenever there's a source code change, it's going to do build everything again. And it's not going to build, again, remember, not only my WAR file or EAR file or anything. It's going to build actually the Docker image right, that's going to run my application. Uh, and then I have another configuration that build an image whenever the builder image changes. This is very, very important, right? Because once you start deploying and developing applications using the Docker model, your artifact, your application artifact contains both dependencies from the application itself, but from the operating system itself. So you need to be very much uh, knowledgeable of that, that your application now contains every single piece of dependency. So if there is a vulnerability in glibc, like we had in March, that affected uh, one third every website, or like J OpenJDK, which we had last month, you have to update the whole image. So that's why we have this build trigger when the, the builder image changes. The builder is the image we're going to use to layer your application, the WAR file, on top. And we, Red Hat, we maintain a set of builder images that we maintain the life cycle. Red Hat is, has always been about life cycle management of open source software, right? Making sure we deliver so, uh, source code and, and binaries that have pass or tests. And we maintain a set of base images. So you will be building your application on a base image that we will always keep updated with the latest security uh, updates, the same way we've been doing Linux forever. Right? Awesome. So and then after the image has been built, my next question is, should I deploy this image? Because one thing is, is building the image. You may want to send this image to another system to test the image, right? You may want to send to another system to check the image. But here I'm just going to say, yeah, as soon as the image is ready, go ahead and deploy that image, OK? Awesome. So another thing, most of the applications that we're seeing being developed today they are essentially smaller applications, right? And if you think about a VM, like what's the smallest amount of CPU resource you can assign to a VM? It's one core, right? You cannot assign half of a core to a VM. You can do over commit on cores, but you cannot, you cannot say to a VM, you're going to use half of a core. But since we are doing with the isolation and resource limiting on process level, we can do like milli cores. And milli cores is one core divided by a thousand. So for this Java application, I'm going to s uh, it's going to do some calculus and memory base, but on the other environment I'm going to show. So for, let's say, the Node.js applications that I play with, I use one-tenth of a core, 10% of a core to deploy my Node.js applications. That means I can have like much more density, and density equals cost savings right there, right? Let's have this in mind. So I'm going to leave this as it is. Right, create. So lots of things are happening. Great things, though. As I said, we're going to go to Thomas Project. So we're now going to, the, to Git. And we're going to clone that repo, as we can see here in the logs. Uh, we're going to clone that repo somewhere here at clone it. Let's see where. OK, yeah, that's uh, cloning that grid, the Git repo right here, cloning source. And it's going to build that source because it's a Java uh, application. We actually guess. So we have a command called no new app, OC new app 
that you point to pretty much anything and we can guess what that is. So if it's a PHP, we'll figure out how to build PHP. If you Node, we'll figure out how to package Node and do NPM install. If it's Java, we're going to figure out if it's Maven or Grad, and we're going to do. So uh, the, the platform is pretty much smart to uh, guess things, right? Of course, if your environment, if your source code is very different, you may uh, want to teach the platform how to build your own source code. Uh, and so it, uh, it built here my source code, right? This build was actually quick. We didn't have to download much Maven dependencies, but in any enterprise environment, you would already have a Nexus or a JFrog, a repository artifact where you would be going to get, right? So in this case, we're going to the internet because it, this is a cloud version, but in any environment, what you'll be doing is you're going to a uh, blessed set of uh, repositories, right? And uh, it's very easy to set up. It's an environment variable Maven proxy URL that is set up, and it's going to use that as a proxy. So right now what's doing it's pushing the image, right? So let, let the push, while it pushes the image, I'm going to switch to my other environment here. And this is the environment which I mentioned in the beginning that is my, uh, uh, the, op op the running on a virtual machine. Very important thing. So this environment that I'll be showing here, it's running on this machine here, right? So it's a full complete OpenShift environment that it is the same environment that you'll be running in production. Now I ask you, how many of you have in the developer's machine the environment as close as possible to running production? You don't, right? Because it's hard to replicate. Now with OpenShift, OpenShift was rewritten in Go, so it's a very modern language. The actual the binary of OpenShift is too small. Now everything written in OpenShift is written in Golang. We rebuilt, we, we decided to rewrite it again a uh, little over two years ago. And so it's very modern technology using modern language. So that's why I can run everything on this small box here. Uh, and to give you an example, uh, I have here a, a my cockpit project. This is cockpit is just an application that's going to show everything that's running on the platform, right? So this helps give us an idea of how many things we have running on the platform. So this shows that on this box, on this single machine that I have here, which is my OpenShift installation, uh, this is my node, right? So this is just one computing node. In any environment, you would have more computing nodes to run the applications. But these are all my uh, deployment uh, pods that I have. And pod is a, in another way to represent a Docker container, right? Because sometimes you want to have more than one container that shares the life cycle. For example, you have a application server and a log scraping tool. They should always run together. Doesn't make sense to have the log scraping tool without the application server, and you should not want the, the application server with how a log scraping tool. So a pod is a way to encapsulate uh, multiple containers in one single atomic uh, entity. Uh, if the pod goes down, everything goes down. If the pod comes up, everything comes up. Right. So let me switch here. While it pushes my image. Fine here. Awesome. So this is just, and then again, this is just an application, right? That comes with OpenShift that shows how things are. Now, let me switch here to another application that I have that my friend uh, built. So this is a microservices application that was uh, written by my colleague, Rafael. Rafael is somewhere here. And this shows that OpenShift, even though it's Docker, and people say that Docker, it's essentially for uh, ephemeral things. No, this application here has a MySQL database and this MySQL database has what we call the persistence value claim, right? So people say like, I don't like containers because it's just for ephemeral. Like if the container dies, I lose my state. No, that is wrong, right? What we have here for this MySQL database is that I have a volume, a persistent volume attached to the container. So if the container goes down for any reason, when it comes up, it's going to have the exact same persistent volume attached. And the way it gets mapped is just a folder mapped into the container. So if, let's say, I, put, I bring this MySQL down and let me do this. Uh, I'm going to open this front end for us. OK, so I have two entries there, right? As you can see, Rafael and Benavides, two entries. And what I'm going to do is I'm brave enough to do this live. I'm going to bring MySQL down. Oh, and you saw how hard it is to bring things down as well, right? And then I'm going to bring it up. Oh, let me just uh, see if anything comes up here. OK. Yeah, it's saying something went wrong. Of course, I just brought down the database. I hope it comes back up. Let me see how smart this is. 
There you go, right? So I brought the container down and I brought it up again. And it, uh, when it brought it up, it read from my volume, persistent volume claim. And then my data is still there, right? Uh, awesome. OK, so I'm going back to the other environment here. The image was successfully pushed. Uh, and here you can see that I do not have a route for my application. Now, how many of you take a long time to get DNS routes created for applications? Like, talking to either network, database, or infrastructure guys, it's always a pain, right? Because they, they are not, like, I'm a developer. So they are not as responsive as developers would like them to be, right? Not saying there are bad people. There are lots of things to carry. But uh, so for in OpenShift, you actually delegate a set of DNS address to OpenShift. So for this cluster here, it's very small. But there's a uh, set of, there's a DNS entry delegated to this cluster. And if I want to create a route for my application, I can just come here, create route. I can make it a secure route or a unsecure route. It's up to me, right? And then I create a route for my application. And that's, that's it. I already have a route created for my application. So that means that uh, that's how complicated it was to create a route. So if I come and access this application here, there you go. I already have. Uh, as you can see, I was doing this demo for another uh, uh, bo body, which I would not like to talk about this. Uh, <coughs> and there you go. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to simulate a, let's say, a, a code change. So because I had configured the build trigger, right? So let me just figure out how to do that. I'm going to be going to my builds. Uh, and I see that I have the simple app build, configuration of my build. And I have the webhook, GitHub webhook URL, show. So I'm going to copy this guy here. I'm going to come to the GitHub repo, settings, webhooks, add this, this thing to uh, 123123. One, two, three. Update this, update the webhook, and I should be all right. So my webhook should be fine. That means if I make a code change, it's going to uh, trigger a webhook on OpenShift. OpenShift is going to build the app and do the whole thing. Let's, let's test it, right? Oops. All right. I think it's here. Should be here. So I'm going to add this file right here, and then I'm going to do this right here, like so just make it, it easier for us. Uh, where is it? All right. So I'm going to change the title here. OK, I'm going to say Java 1 instead of US courts. And as I'm a very good developer, I'm going to, of course, comment my code, right? Very good developer. But as I am a very bad developer, I'm going to commit on the master branch. Don't do that. But still. Uh, all right. So I have uh, committed the code. And then if I come back to OpenShift, let me come back to my overview page, I see that there is already a build happening there, right? So that means that a, a webhook was triggered. And again, this is cloud, right? But it could be the exact same behavior on your environment, right? Uh, it doesn't work with only GitHub. We have also generic webhooks which is a URL that your build system, Jenkins, uh, Travis CI, any, any build system could trigger an OpenShift, say like, I changed the source code. Go build that thing, right? So right now, what's going to do, it's going to do the exact same thing. It's going to build my application, right? And while it does do the build here, I'm going to switch back to this uh, environment here. So this environment here is very interesting, right? It's, it's running a new version of OpenShift, 3.3. Uh, which we will be launching uh, in uh, seven days, six days, in fact. Uh, and it has some very nice monitoring features as well, right? So as you can see here on this UI, I already see how much memory and how much CPU my application is utilizing, right? And I'm going to do something that normally takes time for you in your environments. I'm going to scale this. So this is 12. So right, what happening here is that I'm actually saying, you know that container that has my application? I want 12 copies of that. So it's spinning up 12 copies of that container. And this is only a one environment. 
but you can actually have scheduling policy that say, you know what, this application here that has the label PCI compliant will always have to land on nodes that are PCI compliant. Or this application here that needs to access data on an SSD storage will always la land on, on, on nodes that have SSD storage, right? So here I have my application, and very important thing, we have built-in load balancer. So that means that when I added those 12 containers, 12 pods, I already added those IPs to the load balancing, right? And I didn't need to do anything, that's right it. I just added more nodes and boom, your load balancing right there, right? I'm going to do actually uh, also another very interesting test here for us. I hope it works. I'm gonna bring this guy down here. I'm gonna bring the database down. No, I'm not gonna bring the database down. Uh, as you can see here, we have the database here, right? So let me open a new window. I hope I can log in. Right. So I have two windows with the exact same content, right? So, and now I'm going to test another very cool thing that OpenShift does, which is auto-healing. Auto-healing is the capability of verify the state of things and always to maintain the state. OpenShift is declarative. So you don't tell OpenShift, go do this. You actually do, this is the state I want things to be. So for this MySQL application, there is a JSON file that tells my application should have one copy and should be running. So if anything tries to break that state, for some reason, OpenShift will bring it back up. All right? So I'm going to actually uh, simulate a failure in my MySQL database, right? So right here on the left, what you have is a shell that I have a terminal that are running inside that container. I can only run a terminal inside because one, a cluster administrator allow me to, and because there is bash inside this container. So I'm just doing a PS. And as you can see here, there is a, I think it's this one here, maybe it's this one guy here, PID1, maybe that, that one is the one that's keeping the service running. So I'm going to kill the process. One. I think he's another, let me see. Maybe it's the other one, 63. Yes. So as you can see, after I killed that process, my terminal window was killed. That means that everything that was keeping that terminal running died. See here? For some reason, I'm not killing the right process. Yeah, it should be the one. Huh. Too bad. Am I on the right guy? I'm gonna do it with another container. It's not killing. Uh, I know, but uh, let me see. Maybe it's running on a privilege mode, I don't know. Should be here. There's two more. Yeah, it should be this one. Oops. Okay, now I did, finally, right. As you can see, it killed the process and created another one. Let's do it again. What did I do before? Yeah, for some reason I did something before that worked. Uh, so, but as you can see that the health check works. So I'm going to do the same with another application here just because it's likely going to work better. Uh, it's the guestbook service. Okay, there's a Java app running here. Let me see with this one. Uh, 
I'm not lucky enough today. It's not killing. Hmm. Weird. Okay. I promise it kills. It did once. Yeah, I am running out of time. Okay. Hmm. So I want to show while uh, this doesn't kill, I want to show the trigger before. So this is that app application that was built. Very cool because the, as you can see here, I have even the comments that I apply to my source code. And this is the change that I made, right? For some reason, that environment was not as good as this is. So there you go. Uh, questions? Should have killed. Let's see. Okay. Yeah. That one is killing, yeah. See, this one killed. Yeah. Sure. Uh, I think. It will work with Oracle when Oracle says that Oracle is supported on Docker containers. It will work with Oracle when they say Oracle says it is Oracle is supported on Docker containers. Because the fact that you're running a container does not change the support policy because it's still a operating system, right? Remember, a container from the operating system perspective does not exist. A container is a set of techniques that you apply to protect a process. Container, uh, you cannot say new container on the Linux machine. You can just apply techniques to limit who access to process, what files and uh, network and uh, system calls that specific process has access to. So it's a set of techniques, it's a set of uh, protections you add around the process. From the, uh, let's say, operating system pr perspective, there is no such thing as a container. There, that's why Docker, they did a great job in wrapping all these techniques uh, that uh, that that uh, protect the operating system process. Thank you. Thank you.